All, this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So the discussion today is about the spike proteins difference between this the vaccine generated spike protein and the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. The reason for this difference is that, or the discussion, is that whenever we discuss the spike related pathologies, I see that there are two interesting outcomes. One of that is that folks connect that to vaccine and say, look, vaccine spike is doing this. And the second one is when folks leave comments or they say that I had a vaccine last year and I am scared. And I wanted to make sure that we can understand the differences of the spike protein with the between these two products, the, the virus itself, I'm calling it a product, the virus and the vaccines. So today is not a discussion of a single study, but an analysis of what is the spike in the vaccine and how it is locked and what is its behavior in the body, especially with in context to ACE2. However, please remember this discussion does not attempt to say that the vaccine and its adjuvants and its side effects that we are now observing, it's not something to look into the future. We can look in the past and see that vaccines have side effects as well. So saying that the spike protein, which I will present to you, that spike protein does not bind to ACE2 as the virus's spike proteins do, does not mean that the vaccines do not have the side effects that they have. My own family members are injured. Second part, so second thing that is interesting for me is there, and I think we all know this, there has been no study of a vaccine injury. And what do I mean by that? Yes, there are, there is VAERS and there is V we safe and all that. However, if you look at the vaccines and their safety analysis or their efficacy analysis, what you do is you say, here are the people who got the vaccine. Now we're going to observe them for a year and we would report if they got infected or not, if they went to hospital or not, and so on. However, you may not have seen any study that says, here are the thousand people who are vaccinated. We are going to observe them for any vaccine-related injury. For the vaccine-related injuries, we're also always sent to the VAERS and VSAFEs. And what happens there is, as that data is not as reliable, which we all agree, some folks say it is 10 times lesser than what it should be. Some folks say it is different. Anyways, so the point is that adds confusion in that data. And I think that's a deliberate thing. I've been talking about it. So let's look at some of the data first. This is October 12, 2022. New data is out on COVID vaccine injury claims what is to make of it. And here they say, for example, according to ICANN, 7.7% of the vSafe users, 782,913 people, reported seeking medical attention via a telehealth appointment, urgent care, emergency room, etc. hospitalization. 25% of vSafe users said they experienced symptoms that required them to miss school or work. I'm not actually discussing the vaccine injuries here. I'm discussing how our system has not attempted honestly and sincerely to try to figure out what is the injury. So look at the CDC. The CDC cannot comment on analysis conducted outside of the agency that we have not seen, the spokesperson said via email, but added that vSafe data have shown low rates of medical care after vaccination, particularly hospitalization. So in the first week after getting the shot, the spokesman person uh, continued reports of seeking any medical care, including telehealth appointment, range from 1% to 3%. And, and you can actually see that all of this is just uh, not a very thorough, sincere, authentic engagement. If you see here, 
so this reporter then reached out to various vaccine companies and asked them that, hey, what do you think about this? And the Pfizer media representative in an email said that the company's vaccine has a favorable safety profile and high level of protection against severe COVID-19 disease and hospitalization. Representatives from Moderna and Johnson & Johnson did not respond to requests for comment. Okay, so with this, I would like to then say that it is not lost on me that the vaccines have their side effects as well. Still, it is important discussion to do as medical professionals and as um, folks who are interested in medical sciences to see the differences. So before we start that, this is drbean.com. There's a link in the description. This is a one-time fee of only $67. This is the best gift you can ever get. And it has 900 more lectures access. So take advantage of that. The link is in the description. Now let's start. SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. We have now been talking about it for two and a half years or more. I want to today hone in a very specific part of it. So this is the SARS-CoV-2, this is a spike protein. If you look at this spike protein from top to bottom, these three purple boxes at the top or circles at the top are the S1 part of the spike protein. The remaining part is the S2 subunit. What happens is the S1 part engages with ACE2. And once it is engaged with ACE2, it actually blooms open. And so there are many theories for how does it bloom open. These are three parts. How do they open up? So in a 2016 study of the very first, um, actually there were studies before that as well, but an important study that is used nowadays by vaccine manufacturers where they did something that is called S2P, spike to proline locking. And I'll explain that in a second. In that study, the authors said that when the spike is actually closed, so imagine instead of these five fingers, imagine these are three fingers. <laughs> And let's say this is ACE2. So the author said that when the spike appears or comes closer to the ACE2, the ACE2's attraction, of course, there is the chemical bonds and there is positive ions, uh, positive amino acids and negative amino acids. So there is electromagnetic forces and chemical forces that are at play. So they said that as the spike comes near the ACE2, the attractive force causes it to open up. This is like if you put two magnets together, even before they touch, they can start getting attracted to each other. And if that is some sort of a toy, it is possible that one thing opens up or does something. That is what happens. So when that happens, the spike opens up, those three parts on the top open up and when they open up they reveal with each part is a receptor binding domain and any one of the part can then fuse with ACE2 and that is how the spike would bind and we know that once it is bound then the S1 part is st stick there the S2 part will become cleaved off and and merge with the cell membrane so let me go back to the presentation so here, somebody was saying, make it bigger. Let's see if I can. So here, the S1 part will then be left in the ACE2. And this S2 part will separate because of the TMPRSS2 on our, on our cell that will cleave the, the connection between the two parts of the spike protein. And then the S2 part is like a spring-loaded mechanism that would fire into the cell membrane, and so it will drag the virus as well, and then the viral fusion would occur with the cell, and the viral material or payload would enter in the cell. 
I'm not drawing these things because we have done this discussion many times. My focus is spike protein itself. So now keeping this in mind that we have an S1 unit, we have S2 subunit. Then if you read a little more here, this is also an important concept. And that is the receptor binding domain, which is the part in every, so spikes three pieces in S1 called trimers. Trimer simply means three. Every piece has a re receptor binding domain. And inside of each receptor binding domain is a receptor binding motif. So if you see here, in the S1 subunit, the size of the subunit is 672 amino acids or 14 to 685 residues. Why am I bringing that here? Is there a difference between the spike and of the vaccine or, or the SARS-CoV-2? No. However, it is important to keep this in mind that these residues are not a lot in number. And as you go from whole sub one S1 to the receptor binding domain, which is a smaller part of it, to the receptor binding motif, which is even smaller part of it, you would understand that the number of epitopes or number of amine uh, peptides or the protein lengths are really tiny. Why is that important? That is important that when the antibodies are formed, when our body makes antibodies, Really, we do not have to make a lot of antibodies attacking various parts. If we have to neutralize maybe just a few antibodies will be sufficient to cover receptor binding motif. Why am I saying that? It's a different discussion. I've done that before as well, and that is anti-idiotypical antibodies. And I would do that discussion tomorrow as well because Dr. Bill Murphy, William Murphy's discussion of anti-idiotypical antibody has an update, and the update is that 80% of long COVID patients have anti-idiotypical antibodies. I have been crying from the rooftops to say we should know about anti-ACE2 antibodies. And it turns out long COVID patients, 80% of them have them. So a doctor was discussing that with me today, and I said that means every long COVID patient should be managed as if they have them. So different discussion we'll discuss more tomorrow. Back here. So I hope this is clear now. Spike has three S1s on it. Every S1 has an RBD. That RBD has a receptor binding motif. So I'm going to go to the next article. So these articles I'm, I've used to show various parts of the spike. So here, once again, this is a spike. Here, this yellow part is the receptor binding domain. And then within the yellow, this tinier part is a receptor binding motif. Then let's go to this one. This also is a very decent diagram. Here, if you see, now we are coming close towards the vaccines. So here, if you see, let me see if I can make it bigger. Not really bigger. In this diagram, these little stubby sp spikes actually can have, so these are all called pre-fusion state spikes. Pre-fusion state means it is not fused with ACE2 yet. In the pre-fusion state, a spike can be in a closed state or an open state. And if it is in the open state, it may be one RBD open or two RBDs open. Why? Once again, let, let me explain. Imagine these are three fingers, and that is the S1 part. Every S1 part has receptor binding domain in it. When the, recept the spike is in a pre-fusion state, that is, it is not yet fused with the ACE2. In this state, it can be in a closed state. Closed state means that the receptor binding motif is hidden inside. It is in a closed state. It is also called an up and down state. The receptor binding motif that binds with the ACE2 is usually down and hidden. It is called down state or closed state. Then when the, when the S1 blooms, then this receptor binding domain 
can open up. Now, because there are three S1 pieces, it depends if all of their receptor binding domains will open up or one will open up or two will open up. Generally, one is sufficient to bind with S2. So what happens is you find it to be open on one or two, but not all three. Just some interesting detail. So once the spike has become open in its pre-fusion state, if it becomes open, it has become very close. It was really close to an ACE2. That is why it opened up because of the magnetism. I'm using a, is a flexible term here. Because of the magnetism of ACE2. Once it has opened up, then if you look at it, the leftmost diagram, the little pencil-like straight needle-like structure, that is actually a post-fusion spike. Here, the spike has actually now opened up the RBD and our receptor binding motif is available. That is now going to bind with ACE2 and then a cleavage would occur and that would cause S1 to be separated and S2 will go in its way. Good, so in multiple ways, I have now explained the diagram of an S spike protein. Now, next part. The important thing is, if I go back here for a second, if we can find a way that we can lock the spike protein in this closed state, not in this vertical needle-like state, then in theory, the immunogenicity is better or production of neutralizing antibodies will be better. Now you know that we are struggling, the vaccine by we, the vaccine companies, I am not them, neither am I on their payroll, so I shouldn't say we. The vaccine companies are still struggling to figure out a good spike structure that can help create neutralizing antibodies that are useful. So you're seeing that the vaccine efficacy goes down very fast. However, going back to the theory, the theory is that if we can lock this spike in the pre-fusion state, then we will achieve certain things. Those things are, number one, it will be more immunogenic to produce neutralizing antibodies or because when the virus would enter our body its spike proteins will be in the closed state if we produce antibodies in the closed state then our antibodies will be able to immediately bind with that virus and neutralize it the problem is the spike protein in the closed state is very difficult to keep in the closed state for the virus because it's actually very simple. As the virus enters our body, it would find cells that have ACE2, so the spikes would start blooming and they would start fusing. So let me just quickly answer this question. Jess. Jesse says, with the mRNA spike protein, does it stay in your system long term? I have heard rumors that it stays in your system and continues to replicate. My last sh shot was Feb 22. So no, it does not. And yes, those rumors we have all heard. And uh, no, it does not happen that way. Now the question, of course, you would see now comments that people would say, do, do you not know this study or that study? There is a study that shows that spike protein, so the Pfizer, let's start from the studies. The Pfizer um, pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics data from Japan, that showed that the spike protein produced and the lipid nanoparticles were staying within the muscle for 80% of these were within the muscle and removed within two or three days, but the remnants were here for eight, eight days and they were in liver for 11 days and these were lipid nanoparticle pieces. 
Then there is another study which I have discussed that shows that the messenger RNA in the local lymph nodes is present for even up to, I believe, two months. However, it is not present beyond that. Having said that, if I back up, it is also possible that somebody who is immunocompromised or who is in a state where their immune system cells are not able to take care of the cells that are expressing spikes, then the spike may be there for a longer period of time. We have done those discussions as well, that there is a study that shows that immunocompromised patients have spikes for more than 90 days. And in one case, the infected patient showed the spikes for up to 246 days. So infected and immunocompromised is a different situation. Vaccinated and immunocompromised is a different situation. Healthy is a different situation. So that would mean that it is possible that the spikes RNA will be present for two, three days to seven, eight days. And then in the local lymph nodes, maybe even a couple of months. That is the, the life. Okay, so back here. The Now we know that in the pre-fusion state, the spike is closed or open, but once it fuses, that it, then it becomes needle-like and is post-fusion. Now we are trying to lock this spike in the pre-fusion state. And this locking, as I said, the benefit of the locking is that one, it is better immunogenic. Number two, it will not bind with ACE2. So think about it for a second. For a spike to bind with ACE2, its RBD has to open up. Then that RBD has to fuse with the ACE2 and become post-fused. So the spike that is in the vaccine, I would not say all vaccines, so I'll explain which vaccines. The spike that is in the vaccine is locked in the pre-fusion state, that means in the closed state. Th these are all pre-fusion, closed or open. Open is also pre-fusion. However, it is locked in the closed state. How is that locked? Let me actually show you that diagram as well. It is locked by... Here, so this is a spike, and you see these red spheres here. These red spheres are where prolines and cysteines are changed, so amino acids are changed, and that is locking. There are other mechanisms to lock as well. For example, there is, if you see here, the S1 domain as shown as a transparent molecule, the S2 domain for each promoter is shown as ribbon diagram, each inset corresponds to one of four types of modifications, proline, which we say 2P lock or so on, depending upon the number of prolines, salt bridge lock or disulfide change or cavity filling changes. So there are many changes they've tried. The, <coughs> the changes with the vaccine are called S2P, which is two proline change spike protein. So let's assume that for the locking there, I'm going to show you a six protein change or six proline change lock as well in a second. So back here, once we have locked it in that state, two benefits will come in, better neutralization, which we know that it is really not working very well. And secondly, the lesser or no binding with the AS2. So here is a important point to keep in mind, because this will be right now in your head and that will be, well, the spikes probably do connect with AS2. And if they do not connect with AS2, then how does the vaccine really cause an injury? So two answers. I would show you another study where there are another set of researchers that are offering a six proline lock instead of two proline lock. So imagine you have a lock with those uh, numbers on it and you have two wheels for the numbers, and another set of uh, researchers come in and they say, hey, we can actually create a six wheels for numbers. The, that research for six proline lock, they call it hexapro. They mentioned, and I would show it to you, that two P locked, the one that is in the vaccines, is supposed to be not opening up. 
However, it can open up. And there are certain conditions. For example, it can open up if the vaccine is unfrozen and refrozen or if vaccine sits at 50 degrees centigrade for 20-30 minutes. And then in one more study, they said that inside the body, the dynamics within the cells could also cause the dynamics, meaning electromagnetic forces or amino acids, positive and negative charges and ions and uh, acidity and all those things could cause some spike proteins to open up as well. So that means it is not entirely 100% that all the spikes that are in, made from the vaccine will be locked and not open up. There will be some that would be produced maybe without the lock. There would be some that will be produced damaged. And there would be some that will be produced that would open up. Now, if the vaccine batch got mishandled for the, fr for the freeze or the cold chain, then that vaccine will also open up. So that means it is also possible that in some cases, it is the batch that may drive the vaccine injury because the vaccine, if these were vaccines with the spikes, the spikes opened up. Now, if these are messenger RNAs or DNAs, then there is a different problem. Even in those cases, spike injuries, I believe, more than binding with the ACE2, they come from the adjuvants, they come from the autoantibodies, they come from the molecular mimicry. So it is not that vaccine cannot do these things. It is just that the mechanisms are different from the SARS-CoV-2 itself. SARS-CoV-2 has the raw spike protein, which will open up with the AS2 and go and bind with it and cause all kinds of damages that we have seen. Okay, so I hope this is clear that we, we can have the spike protein in the open or closed state. However, in the case of vaccines, these are locked in 2P state. So here, if you see, the mRNA 1273, that is Moderna, candidate manufactured by Moderna and codes the 2 S2P antigen. And what is that change? S2P is, a stabili is stabilized in its pre-fusion confirmation by two consecutive proline substitutions at amino acid position 987 and 986 and 987 at the top of central helix in the S2 subunit. So in this subunit, S2, let's go here. In the S2 part here, there is actually somewhere at the apex at the top, these two proline changes are done. Now also remember that these changes are not simple to do because anytime you modify a molecule, that can change the, the whole phenotype of the molecule, meaning it can change the whole structure of the molecule. And if you produce antibodies against that changed structure, then the antibodies may not be efficacious against the original structure because this structure has become changed because you removed some amino acids and added some amino acids. And that would come, that can cause confirmation changes. So this is their problem to solve, that when they are creating locks, they have to make sure that overall bigger picture structure of the spike stays as close to the original SARS-CoV-2 spike so that the antibodies can be produced. Plus this spike that is locked in the 2P, in the locked in the pre-fusion closed state. Okay, so continuing. We just saw this, that there are many kinds of changes that can be done in the vaccines now. Let's look at what kind of vaccines have what kind of changes. And this is that uh, Hexapro discussion. So if you see here, H-E-X-A-P-R-O. This is a study where, if I can go up to the top for a second, here the researchers are saying SARS-CoV-2 pre-fusion spike protein stabilized by six, six, <laughs> six, rather than two prolines is more potent for inducing antibodies that neutralize viral variants of concern. So this is another group of researchers coming in saying, hey, you know what? 
two two p changes are not nice enough we should make six p changes then we have found a way to make six p changes without creating too much of a change in the spike protein so the antibodies that will be produced will be able to recognize the sars cov2 as well but in this there are some very interesting uh, pieces of information so of course we know that whenever there is a new technology that comes in they always draw your attention to the weaknesses of the previous technology so here the six proline change folks are talking about two proline change folks and saying hey our our locking is better so look at this they're saying first check this sentence the the likely reason for this enhanced yield what they're saying is that hexapro the six changes create a more enhanced yield of locked spike proteins so they they're saying the likely reason for this enhanced yield is that pre s hexa pro is more stable than pre s 2p right so now researchers are saying that hey the one that is being used in the vaccines is less stable right so it's not me who's saying it it's also not a rumor it's not also not some crazy conspiracy theory this is a researcher saying hey 2p is great as well but that is less stable that's one then they say pre s hexa pro is stable to 3 cycles of freeze thaw 2 days of incubation at room temperature or 30 minute at 55 degree centigrade it, it is stable however look at this pre s 2p that is the one that is used in vaccines showed aggregation after 3 cycle of freeze thaw so it became kind of misstructured and began unfolding after 30 minutes at 50 degree centigrade of course our body is not at 30, 50 degree centigrade so if we are making spikes on the mrna then 50 degree centigrade may not be the right answer for them to bloom they might bloom for other reason however if it is a pre made spike protein and if it needs higher temperature or sorry lower temperature then at 50 degree that batch could become bad then they say further structural analysis found that pre s2p may not be the optimal pre fusion confirmation because a k986p mutation may break sar bridge between promoters that contribute to trimer stability so now they are picking one more problem to say that it is actually possible that 2p lock can break and that would cause the spike to bloom okay i want to quickly answer a couple of questions here if i can so jessie says i know my digestive issues and parts are due to the vaccine which i have been struggling for over a year right after my first shot since my last shot was in feb 22 is it possible my new neurological symptoms are possible yes and um, i'm actually i have been talking about the neurological symptoms and the possibilities for those um if you look for long story short with dr bean that is flccc had asked me to produce a series of talks all focused on long story on long covid and vaccine injury and i have produced a number of talks now i believe 32 talks they are present on a dr bean chan on a uh, sorry youtube channel called long story short with dr bean it is funny it doesn't even have a thousand subscribers but if i think the gold mine of long covid issues is actually present there so please uh, see that i talked about neurological issues and methylene blue in the last talk i think that would be uploaded in a week or so tomorrow for flccc i'm going to record methylene blue and neuroprotection especially the apoptosis protection so please keep an eye on that so yes it can be and then jessy says is it possible these new symptoms are vaccine injury even though my blast shot was in fev and i'm noticing in yeah it is possible okay so going back here 
so J john says that bill gates in fact um, funded it so at this time for me funding is not really the important thing what is interesting is the 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 technology and how the spike protein 2 s2p is supposed to stay stable and how it is possible that it is not so once again starting again from here further structural analysis found that pre s2p may not be the optimal perfusion confirmation pre-fusion confirmation because a k986p mutation may break a salt bridge between promoters that contribute to trimer stability so this modification can actually make the spike unstable that means some of the spikes can bloom so not only they can cause antibodies which is their purpose then the adjuvants in the vaccine are trying to kick the immune system to do more and that can cause uh, issues as well then the then the adjuvants and the components of the vaccine cause allergic reactions and more issues as well however the spike itself which is supposedly safer because of the locking can become unstable and you are reading it here then the currently approved SARS-CoV-2 vaccines and several phase 3 vaccine candidates are using 2P or native full length S. This is very important to keep in mind, native full length. That means no modifications at all, just the raw spike protein. So let's see. The current Moderna and Pfizer mRNA vaccines are based on S2P with the native furin cleavage site, transmembrane domain and cytoplasmic tail. So what does this mean? They're saying, let me do some, <laughs> some drawing. So what they're saying is that the Moderna and Pfizer has, so let's say these are the S1 trimers. And then down here is the S2 piece, right? So the S2 has the 2P cleavage, uh, sorry, 2P um, lock here at the apex. Then it still has the furin cleavage. The furin cleavage is really an area where the TMPRSS2 breaks this to separate these two components. It has a furin cleavage as well. That means it is a possibility of our TMPRSS2 to kind of try to cleave this, even if the spike is not open. And then they say there are some salt bridges in this as well. So that is the Moderna and Pfizer. What does this mean? It has this stability added, but it has this cleavage that can be taken advantage of by our cells to cleave it and open it. And the other one is that this can be unstable. The question, another study that is missing, and this is why I think that that sincere sincerity and honesty to understanding how this this medicine is doing isn't really there, or people are scared of doing this. Another study that needs to be done is that if this cleavage site is open, if this is open, how many of these bloom, and what do they do? It's actually an easy study to do, but it's not done. Then. And sorry, transmembrane domain and cytoplasmic tail. So this, remember that is our cells will make this spike protein because the messenger RNA would go in the cell and the cell will make it. So they say that it has a transmembrane domain. So it has a additional protein attached to it, which will supposedly make sure that this spike protein, even if it tries to get out of the cell, does not get out, out and get stuck in the membrane so that is this transmembrane domain and it has a little tail cytoplasmic tail on the inside of the cell so this is a whole structure now this transmembrane domain is added new that's not part of the original SARS-CoV-2 spike then this the inter sorry cytoplasmic tail is also added new the 2p is added this domain is added this tail is added 
The point of doing this is that it gets stuck on the membrane and is not going to leave. Although, remember, there was a study that showed that the spikes did leave even after those domains. Okay, so back here. The CHADOX1, so Oxford AstraZeneca based vaccine, developed by AstraZeneca as well as the AD Edno 5 vector vaccines developed by CanSino and AD2685, remember Sputnik vaccine developed by Gamalia, use the native full length S protein. These guys, Oxford AstraZeneca, CanSino, and Sputnik, they have native full length spikes. So their spikes are open to bloom. Now, here is an interesting thing to keep in mind. It is not necessary that AstraZeneca is doing anything worse than messenger RNA based vaccines. However, we know that AstraZeneca vaccine or Oxford AstraZeneca has been blocked in many countries. And a sister vaccine, Johnson & Johnson, is not approved in the, or not recommended unless nothing else is present. Now, let's look at Johnson & Johnson. The subunit vaccine candidate developed by Novavax and Sanofi employs S2P. So, sorry, did I say Johnson & Johnson? I meant Novavax. Johnson is here. So the Johnson, uh, Novavax has S2P. So what do we have? Moderna and Pfizer, 2P. Janssen or Johnson & Johnson, 2P with furin cleavage site deleted. So I somehow missed that part. So Johnson & Johnson has this 2P as well, but this furin cleavage site is removed. So our TMPRSS2 cannot try to bind with it and do fun things. And then, and has a transmembrane anchor. So it has the rest of the thing. So the Johnson & Johnson just doesn't have this part, but has everything else. And now my wife received Johnson & Johnson one dose and developed an injury that she had to battle with for a whole year. And now she... I think she still has some remnants, for example, if she eats or exercises or, or becomes stressed, some symptoms pop up again. But that vaccine in its structure is very similar to Pfizer and Moderna. The only difference is that this part is removed. So this tells you that it is not just the spike protein. Actually, the vaccine spike protein where it is modified may have less to do with the AS2 compared to the SARS-CoV-2, but vaccines have other things to them. Plus, because vaccine really bother our immune system to say, become active, do something, then the adjuvants and others can also cause immune responses that in some people cause injury. So the, the uh, Novavax has S2P. So then they say, this is hexaprotein. Then they say, with the recent emergence of variants of concerns, it is not known whether two, S2P is the best antigen for vaccine development. So the newer technology folks are looking back and saying, hey, this is not the best technology. The most striking, striking finding in this report is that antibody induced by hexapro are significantly more effective in neutralizing. So then they talk about their own vaccine. Okay, so then more links about the pre-fusion state and what is the benefit of closing it in that state. So once again, here, pre-fusion and hexapro. Then an article, if you would like to read it, ACE2 interactions reveal novel things and finally epitopes. So this is the discussion. What is the takeaway of this discussion? The takeaway is the vaccine spike protein, except those that have native length vaccines, for example, adenovirus-based vaccines 
uh, Oxford, AstraZeneca, Sputnik, and CanSino, which have the whole raw spike protein, which can do equal damage as SARS-CoV-2. Moderna and Pfizer's spike protein and Johnson & Johnson, and remember Johnson & Johnson does a lot of damage as well. They have pre-fused closed vaccines, uh, sorry, uh, spike protein. This tells you that it is not just a spike protein because vaccine injury occurs as well. So uh, that is a discussion. The reason I did this, I would wrap it up with the same message. The reason I did this is that whenever we talk about spike protein-based studies, the first reflex is to say, this is vaccine. But spike proteins can cause from the SARS-CoV-2 a lot of damage. I think that the number of open blooming spikes from COVID are more than from the vaccine. But it is a tragedy that we do not have correct data for the vaccine, which has enabled so many folks to create rumors. So that is a discussion. If you would like to have more talk about it, tell me and I'll come back and we'll do a chit chat and we'll answer the questions. Otherwise, I hope that this is... So then Trevor says, why is there no difference between vaccine injury and long hauler? So very good question. And before I discuss that, how about we actually do another chit chat so this discussion doesn't become very long. Um, nowadays, there is a new trend which people have started saying that long COVID is just a vaccine injury and nothing else. That is an incorrect and an unfair thing to do because there are people who do not have vaccine and they are injured and have long COVID. There are people who had vaccine and then got COVID and developed long COVID. And there are people who had vaccine and got injured as well. So it is so wrong to just continuously say that I think that whoever has long COVID is actually a vaccine injury. That's just not correct. Okay, so if you want to talk about this, we can do a chit chat. So I can hang up this one and then we'll do a chit chat. So do me a favor, please. Uh, please like, subscribe, and share. This talk, I know, is going to get a lots of unsubs from my channel, but that's how life is. I just cannot hide these things. We need to talk about them as medical professionals. I'm not a propaganda channel to only talk pro-vax or only talk anti-vax. I have to talk about benefits of the vaccine and the, the harms of the vaccine as a medical book should do. So anyways, please like, subscribe, and share. There are links in the description. If you would like to support this work as well, then you can buy me a coffee. You can use PayPal. There are many other kind of links as well to support it. With this, I'm going to hang up, and then I'll come back. And please, let's see if we can keep our questions around the spike protein. Vaccines, SARS-CoV-2, spike proteins, then that will be great. Thank you very much. See you soon.